awesome. Here we go. Hey. Yo, how's it going? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. We're five days into the new year. How are you doing? I'm tired. (laughs) (laughs) I couldn't wait to say that, but I, I am tired. It feels less, I don't know about you, it feels less like a new year to me this year. It's weird. It really does. Like, I just, time is a construct. (laughs) It is a construct. (laughs) The longer that we are in, like, this A season of, like, our lives, like, being in our 20s, B, being in this season of existence with the pandemic, I'm just like, time's a construct. It really is. I mean, we kind of started this March of 2021, right? Uh, February. No, 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 2020. Yeah, no, wait. What year is it? It's 2022 now. It was March 2020, right? When no, we started. When I was sent home. Yeah. And here we are. Oh my gosh. Here we are. Like, this is this is fine this is fine (laughs) this is everything's fine yeah everything is fine yay so we're reading uncomfortable conversations with a black man by emmanuel ocho um and he's a sports dude so i'm not a sports person i don't even know what this guy plays right he played football And I mean, I was like reading the chapters. I didn't realize how young he is. I don't think he had a long football career, but he did play football. I can't tell you. I could look it up, the teams he played for. Um, And now he's kind of like all over the place with like non-sports thing. Like, even if you told me like this guy was like on the Olympic curling team, I wouldn't (laughs) know what it was because I couldn't, I couldn't name more than probably five sports. This is mm-hmm. me being embarrassing. <laughs> Tennis, basketball, football, soccer. There's got to be another spin. <laughs> <laughs> Baseball. There we go. There we go. She made it to five. <laughs> That's okay. I, I think I dive enough in the sports world for both of us. Yes, you are going to be carrying this book because there might be a sports reference and I will be like, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, this is fine. I totally understand this. <laughs> oh yeah, track and field. That's another one. <laughs> We're fine. He played for the Philadelphia Eagles and the Cleveland Browns. Oh, and he played in college at University of Texas. You know, as a Texan or former Texan, I should have probably known something about that. (laughs) Oops. Um, I don't know. Y'all have like a lot of football players. I feel like. (laughs) It's true. It's true. There was a, um, so I did, this is going completely off track, but you know, I played uh, club Quidditch in college, right? Mm -hmm. Um, There was an article that came out one time that was connecting Texas football culture to why all of the Texas Quidditch teams were so aggressive. That's funny. I would love to take that a step further and like link it to like why we all had brain damage, but like, (laughs) so this is like really, really exciting um, because we get to like delve a little bit into sports, I think with this, Mm -hmm. but so we did you read the introduction or did you yeah okay I just want to know what your first initial thoughts were from the first line of this book it says dear white friends country persons welcome yeah I I read that and I was just like so this book isn't for me (laughs) but I proceeded anyway so we made it past the first line (laughs) yes Exactly. I just remember like reading that and just being like, hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see it kind of felt like, oh, great. Another thing focused on white people. But I get it. I mean, the title of the book definitely invites conversation for people who are uncomfortable with this topic. I mean, not to say people of color aren't uncomfortable with this conversation, but 
right now, I think like the push is to really educate non people of color. I think that like, um, I think it'll be interesting from our perspective since we have like thought about and have both studied like race and this whole kind of realm. Like we have studied it in our own um, grad school. I don't know if you studied it a little in undergrad or anything like that, like in sociology classes, but specifically whenever we were in the social work school, we talked about race a lot. So like, I'm feeling like this book is going to be kind of not elementary to us, but stuff that we've heard before. Mm. But like, I'm still yeah. really interested to hear his perspective. For yes. sure. I'm, I've read it. <laughs> so I'm rereading it. So I'm really excited to re hear what he has to say. And I'm sure I'll catch something that I missed the first time. So yeah, I'm really, I, I do love this book. What I'm excited about is the fact that my father has also read this book <laughs> and I am excited to have discussions with him after this, my, mm. my white adoptive father. So this should be fun. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> he also loves football and hates that I never caught on to sports. He really does hate that so much. <laughs> so it talks about a little bit in the introduction it talks about his background and I also didn't realize how recent this book was because it mentions COVID already in mm -hmm. here and I was just yeah. like ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean this book is like I think a response to the call that that has been like kind of amplified with like the killing of George Floyd like very recent day things I think he wrote this in response so yeah it's definitely like it must be one of them I mean we've read like two books but I think this is the most recent one we've read where we're like actually in the times of it yeah so and like we're definitely still in here so it, mm -hmm. like the whole introduction talking about that and then I think it really sets up really well like what the book is about to be whenever he, uh, one sentence paragraph. Oh yeah, here it is. Um, even if none of the above descriptions fit you, like whenever he talks about, um, racism being like, you're not like a KKK member, but you're also not someone that identifies strictly as anti-racist. Like you're somewhere in between maybe like a level two or a level three. Mm -hmm. And then he goes further and says like, pause, did that make you uncomfortable to read? Like, mm -hmm. it definitely feels like he is talking still to me at some point because they're like, while I don't identify as a white person, KKK member, or mm -hmm. that degree of a racist, there are still like very like innate biases that I'm still unlearning. Mm -hmm. And it's like one of those things in your mind that you're just like, oh, I don't want to be discriminatory. Am I actually a bad person? Right. Like, that kind of brain mechanism so whenever he pauses the writing to just be like did that make you uncomfortable eh, eh. <laughs> it's like talking straight to you yeah yeah which I think is a nice touch mm -hmm. it definitely adds to the conversation part that we're kind of missing because we're reading his book as opposed to like sitting down and having coffee or tea with him yeah and I mean like I just checked his Instagram out and uh, he has a direct email on there. So if we wanted to email him, I also tagged him in my Instagram story and to tell him that we were reading this. So fun stuff. Yeah, we might get some response. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I will, I will say the questions come from his email, questions that people have emailed him in the past. So every question in this book that he's addressing has been asked. Through that email address, I imagine. Wow. And like that takes a lot of energy just to be like, all right, email me anything. Cause you know, I've always thought of those like advice columnists just to be some of the most patient human beings ever. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because if you were to open your email to a room full of white people who had never discussed race before, like personally, I don't think I would be super prepared to see what it would do to me 
like mm-hmm. internally and how I would react to some of the questions because I've gotten some questions from white people before and they've been pretty dumb questions. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I just think in like social media times, it's so dangerous to be so accessible, especially, I mean, because of this platform he has. I'm sure he's he's gotten a lot of good questions and people who want to learn, but I'm sure he's gotten like a lot of hate too. So to open yourself up to that, Mm -hmm. like what would it take for you to be willing to like open your dms to like that kind of a thing if you had his platform like a million dollars or like yeah i don't know if there would be enough money in the world (laughs) honestly Uh, i feel like i'd be one of those people who you like could you would never see (laughs) just because i don't i don't think i would open myself up to that personally Mm -hmm. what do you think like it's it's kind of harder for me to imagine that because I do have white family members. So I do have white family members like sliding into my text, sliding into my DMs um, and asking that. And then whenever I say, I want you to think about that a little more critically, like your question, think mm-hmm. about why that might be easing towards racist. Cause I don't want to flat out call them a racist. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'll call out like racist tendencies, but then they'll be like, but would you rather have me not have asked the question? And I was just like, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, just think a little more critically before you ask a question. But then it kind of goes into this back and forth, like downward spiral. And we just devolve into like all of that. So I think Mm -hmm. it's really great that this book is here to kind of be that bridge so I can just like hand them out like this book instead of having to answer individually. Yes, I think that goes like just so beautifully into the fact that like sometimes we're just not gonna wanna answer. We're not gonna wanna be the person that you ask every single question about race to. Mm -hmm. So it's nice that there's another resource on top of like the ample amount that are already there. for. And I think he breaks down topics that, people ask and um I think he picks really good questions well first of all I think he breaks down the topics really well and second of all I think he picked really great questions yeah so the first question out of the gate Mm -hmm. talks about it says you and me for part one and then the question is how do you bring up race with minorities Someone said, I honestly have so much fear of saying something wrong and being labeled as a racist. I'm sure things will come out wrong or sound unaware because they are. But how will I learn if we can't even discuss? And it was written by Melissa. Mm -hmm. So I love that he opens with a question and then goes into the chapter right Mm -hmm. there. So first chapter gets right to it. And it's the name game. Is it Black or African American? And it straight up just goes into the history of the vernacular. So I loved how he did it. Um, I didn't even know most of what he brings up. But I think that was a really great question because like I've personally been asked this and I'm like, it's it's so based on each person, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is a really hard answer to tell someone who wants like a this is the right answer, this is the wrong answer. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I think the way he sets it up, like even the way he formats his book is just so beautiful for a conversation about race. Mm-hmm. Like I, I love how he puts it like, okay, if someone's name is like Jeffrey and you, and he wants to go by Jeff, you ask him, mm-hmm. you can ask him and it doesn't hurt to like ask, but so many people are so afraid to ask. hmm about that and like I think a lot of it also comes from like a person's tone of voice whenever they're asking about it because like um what was it I was having a conversation the other day when someone was asking me whether or not I thought um I thought it was okay to call someone a Native American or Indigenous and I was just like well, I'm not a great authority on that because first <laughs> right. of all, look at me. <laughs> but like the person was also um, referring to someone who was indigenous to 
South America or Canada. I can't even remember mm. the um the specific conversation, but I remember them saying, "No, Native American." And I was like, well, "I don't know if they call themselves that." Mm-hmm. Um and then just suggesting, eh, "Maybe you should ask someone from that population." Yeah. <laughs> like it really doesn't hurt to like just ask and if someone can tell if you're genuine Mm -hmm. like yeah i think that's key i mean certainly asking you someone who's not a member of the community is not (laughs) there's not a solution there (laughs) i was just like great that you're curious (laughs) maybe don't ask me (laughs) (laughs) Like, um, but like, I didn't even know any of the history about it either. And so like, whenever they, um, whenever he was talking also in the section of let's get uncomfortable in his first, in his first chapter, like it kind of made me think of that. A conversation I've seen a lot of people on Instagram using, like, do you capitalize the B in black? Mm. And it's also like someone um, asking whether or not, like, I don't know if like comparing Asians is a fair comparison uh, just because of the different histories, but like, mm. um, like whenever someone says do you consider yourself more asian or do you consider yourself more like chinese american or chinese or something like that Mm. because it just has like both you can be both at the same time and yet different in my opinion if someone asked me um asian american capitalized asian Mm. and emphasize the asian but I also okay. don't know the entire history of capitalizing be behind black either. Yeah. So I don't know. I just feel like person. just thinking about like grammar rules, I thought it was always capitalized because we're talking about like the name of a race. Mm-hmm. Like I'll have to like, I'd have to like look back on my Instagram because I know that there have been people who have explained this before Mm -hmm. and I'm just drawing a blank right now because I'm just like which Instagram account is that you can lose track of Instagram so fast yes there's so much information all over Mm -hmm. I would just always say and I mean I think he brings up a good point like it really depends because he's Nigerian Nigerian Mm -hmm. American like if you want to say African American and my personal thing with African American is that the Af- the link to African heritage for African Americans has been severed. Well, unless we're talking about like a Emmanuel Acho or like a Barack Obama who have very clear ties to their African heritage. So I always like black and I also like the fact um when he was talking about like colored or negro and he was saying that those were from white people. <laughs> so a lot of people are going to I mean of course with the awful history attached to both of those words like it's an absolute no but that's another thing to think about like how much of this is from white people like how much of this do we get to create for ourselves and do we get to own Mm -hmm. like it just in like me thinking about like I've been watching Marvel so like the whole like multiverse type idea like in and I in a multiverse situation where like the world wasn't colonized by white people I wonder what we would refer to ourselves as. Yeah. Like this is a huge reason why I want to make it a goal this year for myself to read more Asian, uh, Asian literature and Asian nonfiction, because I want to see how Asians refer to themselves within their own, within their own words, not borrowing from the English language, not borrowing from like a white centered Uh, point of view Mm. have you found anything so far or is this like the start of that it is january 5th i am tired (laughs) that's a good point i i really love that 
like because we talk about like critical race theory and things talk uh being talked about in schools and like teaching like quote unquote real history and like my history curriculum in texas i can guarantee you was not straight up truth most of the time (laughs) um but like it's also um just going in there it's exhausting to have to dig for yourself Mm -hmm. and having to figure that out for yourself whereas like I feel like the white version of history has just been spoon-fed to us since that's already the dominant narrative Mm -hmm. like we have to work that much harder Mm -hmm. and it's just like it shouldn't exhausting and it shouldn't be that way because we're a melting pot and we're a combination of so many cultures so ideally you'd be able to find the history of each culture so easily and not like the whitewashed history the actual history from documentation and from the stories of people Mm -hmm. exactly like huh because I'm just I'm just trying to think about like prominent like names like we could we can name like very prominent historical white figures like off off the bat like that Mm -hmm. if um if someone asked us but like um if you were to if someone were to ask us like hey who's a prominent Chinese American I would be sitting here like scratching my chin for a little bit yeah like okay oops Mm -hmm. oh my goodness and that's one thing that um in Kendi's podcast when he had one of his guests and she was just talking about like the backlash that the 1612 project gets uh for like being taught in schools which is the project that's just saying starting history from when slaves were brought over and so she was saying it's so crazy and the backlash is so ridiculous because then you're really hearing not just from like the point vamp point of history where slaves come over and you're hearing from actual slaves but you're also hearing just in like throughout history you're hearing from the side of the people who are oppressed which right now we just don't hear from so you hear more authentic history in total not just for black people for everyone and i think that like like um people who have been oppressed and like whose voices haven't been heard i think that's so great for the accessibility that we have with the internet and technology today because everyone does get to share their story and have um and have like more of an equal playing field and more equal access. Don't get me started on like shadow banning and like that kind of stuff with and gatekeepers with the big tech companies because I will go down a rabbit hole and a and a fun little <laughs> rant there. Um, and I will be right there with you. <laughs> I'm not saying that we need to like have like action against monopolies in tech. But they did that with the railroads. I'm just saying. Just saying. Yeah. You need to apply monopoly laws to big tech because we are, our lives are being owned by it. It's fine. We're fine. Um, Everything's fine. <laughs> this is fine. We're doing a podcast about a book club in a pandemic. <laughs> it's all fine (laughs) it is fine um I just and I also just love how like short and sweet and to the point this um this book is because the first chapter was like what five pages yeah super short yeah the whole book is like 200 pages so it's something that can be read in an afternoon but Mm -hmm. I'm excited that we're gonna take a lot of time to just like go into it Mm -hmm. was there anything that stuck out to you in these first two sections that we read um the first um I really loved the historical timeline because it talks about things that are so like it seems like it's history but at the same time my dad was alive for this like Mm. 
like I think what's crazy is it talks about something as recent as 1988 which is wait wait six years yeah I was like how old are we (laughs) which was six to seven years just before we were born it talks about in 1988 black meter Uh, leaders met in Chicago to discuss the national Black agenda, where some of them proposed replacing Black with African American, and talking about how that what like, how the word African American became the like, prominent word to use to describe in the 90s. And then that's what we grew up with. We grew up with African American, because we are children of the 90s. Mm-hmm. And like now that it's within the whole Black Lives Matter movement in our 20s. Wait, no, actually, it started in 2012. We were still in our teens. Mm-hmm. Wow. Because it was the Ferguson, it was Ferguson protests. Mm-hmm. I want to say it was 2012. I'm going to look that up really quick. Um, we were still in our teens. And so we kind of came of age with the term Black Lives Matter, and we're still in our 20s coming of age with it. Yeah, it's, it's like, because I I remember being a kid, and we were talking about like, African American versus Black, and I remember, I think I told my mom, I was like, I prefer African American, because I'm not Black, like, thinking the literal Black, like, the color of my microphone, Black, Mm -hmm. and my granddad, he goes, I'm Black, I've always been black and I always will be black. And then I remember my cousin, it went full circle because she was probably, I don't know. She was very young. (laughs) She's still young, but she was younger. And she said the exact same thing. She was like, I'm not black. Like thinking the physical like color Mm -hmm. um, as opposed, but now it's just like, it's funny to me when people say (laughs) African-American personally to me, like black is absolutely fine. But I think he did a good job. Um, explaining that because like it's a personal preference to each person you're talking to Um, but yeah Black Lives Matter I think really it's the most mainstream thing I could think of in terms of identifying as Black and like really just taking ownership of whatever identity you choose because like um, personally I don't like being called yellow I think it's weird I don't look yellow I like if someone were to hand me like a yellow crayon whenever I was like coloring in preschool I would not use that on myself Mm -hmm. um I mostly used like tan or brown but um yeah it says um uh Black Lives Matter started in July 2013 that was the year we that was the year I graduated high school we're the same age right are we the same I I may be a year younger because I was 2013 a junior Yeah. Okay. All right. Cause I forgot that I took a year off after college. That is neither here nor there. (laughs) 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 But I, I think what's interesting about the, um, the Asian population during this time is the, the hashtag that I see most often with it is hashtag stop Asian hate Mm -hmm. like they don't they don't say yellow anywhere near that Mm -hmm. which I'm like low-key grateful for because I'm not a huge fan of the word yellow just sounds weird just no yeah as a a (laughs) word just race aside as a word throw it away I, for the well, also what I see is Asian. I don't ever see yellow. Mm-hmm. And like it was white people that came up with the with the term yellow, too. Crazy. Let me ask you this though, since we're on this, how do you feel about Oriental? Ooh, mm, that is interesting. I think because I've heard it compared to like. Um, I've heard it used in comparison to like saying like a white person is a Caucasian, 
like mm. descend from like the Caucasus mountains or something in Eastern Europe. I don't know Mm-mm. the way that humans like to like create these little boxes that we put each other in. Mm-hmm. It's so interesting. Um, because like there was another time when like I, we were going over, uh, what was it? It was World War II, and that was the first time I had heard the word Aryan to describe mm. white people. Mm-hmm. And so I was just like, huh. So white people can call us Oriental and can call other people like that. But if I were to try to say the word Aryan, I'm considered, I would be considered racist. Wow that that made it very interesting to me I think for me it's the intention behind the word I've never I've heard people like call me oriental not in a not in a derogatory way before but as they like the intention behind it was not hostile but it still felt weird Mm -hmm. and it felt still kind of like just like a gross taste on the tip of your tongue kind of like that almond banana smoothie I had earlier (laughs) (laughs) that's a perfect example I exactly know what you're talking about now (laughs) because you saw my face while I was drinking it (laughs) I did (laughs) Mm, but it was the last time I think I was called Oriental was by either my grandma or one of my grandma's friends. And mm. they used it in like kind of an endearing way, but it still felt weird. Yeah. Hmm. That's an interesting question. Cause like if someone randomly like on the subway were to call me Oriental, I'd probably say Oriental this and then punch them. Um <laughs> As you said. <laughs> but yeah, someone's asked someone's asked me that before. Um, and I was just like, where did the word the Orient come from though? Hey. That was a very imperialistic word, wasn't it? Mm. So that was a very long drawn out explanation for that question but thanks for asking (laughs) (laughs) I just feel like there's a common theme when we're talking about how to identify people I remember because I studied Spanish in college Mm -hmm. and so the difference between Hispanic and Latino Mm -hmm. like always came up and I was talking to one of my friends who is Hispanic and like depending on how you define it also Latino and uh she was asking me she was like wait what was the difference again I was like I don't know I thought that was supposed to be you it's just I think like specifically Hispanic Latino and I mean I'm not a member of the community Mm -hmm. I could of course be wrong I just think and with all of these words it's just a a way to like box people into a certain group they don't actually have any significance Mm -hmm. Words are also a construct. If we wanted to go that (laughs) deep, language is a construct. (laughs) The brain named itself. Um. (laughs) It's all a construct because I don't, I think we make it a bigger deal with our emphasis on vocabulary than it actually is. Mm -hmm. And I think it's whenever people start putting value to Mm. like putting the value to the different descriptors like someone decided someone back in the day decided that one person ranked higher than the other in terms of human human value but I'm just like that's no right oh <laughs> uh, and like it's the value that you give the words to ah mm-hmm. <sighs> language is weird uh, julia michaels this is so off subject oh my goodness but she has this song or album i think it's the album it's called love is weird but i think it's also a song and so now i, I just, love julia uh, michaels isn't she amazing i saw her one time here <sighs> i'm jealous i i genuinely love her she was my last concert before the pandemic hit. 
<laughs> I just think like because it's love is a mess mm -hmm. and if you just like underline love and then replace it with literally everything I think it's all a mess I think she was on to something mm -hmm. it is it is a whole mess because like mm -hmm. um <clears throat> Just the idea that like someone decided that these are quote unquote rules to live by and this is what we're going to call this and this is what we're going to call that and this is how I'm going to relate to you and so on and so forth. It's just, <sighs> it is ridiculous. And every time I hear like, like describing different races in that, I always think of two things. One, the like government forms, like passport files and uh, applications and things like that, yes. where you have to click your race and then your ethnicity, or that little song that we learned in Sunday school, the Jesus loves the little children song. Mm -hmm. and it <laughs> feels weird singing it now. Yeah, specifically when they get to the weather and then all of the colors. Yeah, I get what you mean. Because I think even like red is a color. Mm -hmm. It's not yeah. right. <laughs> it's certainly one I would not teach my kids if I had kids. <laughs> I think we could skip that. Yeah, yeah. Let's just, I, I yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's make like, uh, more re realistic uh, Jesus songs for little kids. We can talk about like the, um, what was it? The one where like people got eaten by lions. That one. <laughs> <laughs> I think of all people, of course you would <laughs> want it. The morbid Bible stories. The morbid Bible stories, the one specifically about the plagues where people had just like gross welts and boils on them. Yeah. <laughs> that that seems like it would be a topic. <laughs> My parents regret making me read the entire Bible so much. <laughs> I only bring up the gross parts. <laughs> Those are only the best parts though. I mean, can we really blame you? Uh, like, uh, so just like, Going back to um, this entire chapter, what e chapter and the development of how different races refer to themselves now that we kind of have more ownership over our own race, which definitely the fact that we are in the 21st century, the year 2022, mm -hmm. that we are just now starting to say, hi, I'm Asian and I can own the word Asian now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, humans. Um, <laughs> I'm interested to see like what kind of words will be used as descriptors in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine off the top of my head, if I had to guess, it would be a little more fluid, like when everything happening with like sexuality and gender and how fluid it can be. And just mm -hmm. there aren't boxes anymore, I don't think. And I think it would be so cool if that would be able to transcend towards race and ethnicity because I love how fluid we can mm -hmm. be with gender and sexuality. But well, yeah, I'm excited to see. We'll see if I'm right or completely wrong. <laughs> yeah, watch us like be listening back to this in like 20 years and just being like, whoa, <laughs> Hannah really doesn't shut up. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so the next, the next, um, question that he asks is what are some of the best ways that you find that you can get rid of your implicit bias? And we're going to talk about that next time. Yeah. I can't wait. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sitting here and going down that rabbit hole with me. Yes, thank you. New year, new anti-racist conversations. Yep. <laughs> so excited. Well, I will see you next week. Uh-huh. Bye. Bye.
Bye. Bye.